you. May it please the court. Uh, we will try on the side of the respondents to be precise and concise. Let me start off by thanking uh, Dr. Ogada and Mr. Ongoya for their very kind remarks about the small role I have played in the development of our constitution and law. Thank you very much. I also want to thank Council for the civility that has been observed in uh, the presentation of this matter. And I do hope that <coughs> the respondents will also remain civil so that uh, we extend uh, the proper respect that the court deserves. I am instructed by the Honorable the Attorney General, a very eminent Dorcas Ward, our first female Attorney General, And she instructs me to inform the court that she is here because Article 156 sub Article 6 enjoins the Attorney General to promote, protect, and uphold the rule of law and to defend the public interest. The people of Kenya have a public interest in the maintenance of a stable government and in the protection of the sovereignty of their republic. And that republic is underpinned by having continuity in the institutions of government, be they the legislature, be it the judiciary, or be it the executive. We shall be submitting that the public interest is in favor of an expeditious disposal of matters that affect the continuity of government and that imperil the stability of the state. And that human rights are not only accorded to individual applicants, they are also accorded to the collectivity called Kenya and the people of Kenya they also have human rights. I agree with my learned friend, Mr. Ongoya, who is a very eminent uh, constitutional jurist and a practitioner of the constitutional law. I agree with him when he says the Constitution 2010, in many ways, is transformative, has introduced more versatility in the protection of human rights. That is true. I also agree with him when he says that the Constitution must be construed in a manner to give full effect and protection to the rule of law and to human rights. But I further submit this, that the Constitution too must be interpreted so as not to create an absurdity. The Constitution must be construed so as not to create an absurdity or to put it in conflict with itself. What is the purpose of the Constitution? To establish the state. What is, its father, uh, what is its father purpose? To provide for democratic government and to protect 
the rule of law and to protect human rights. These are not, these are not in contradistinction. These are not at war with each other. A stable government, a sovereign people, and human rights are not in conflict with each other. They are in harmony. It is the work of the court to interpret in order to create that harmony. When the court is, inter is invited to interpret the constitution so as to create an absurdity, it must refuse to do so. This afternoon, you are being invited to interpret the constitution to create an absurdity. Why is it an absurdity? The Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya can swear in the President of the Republic of Kenya into office. What a huge power. What a huge authority. The, Chief Just the Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya can empanel a panel of judges can, oh sorry, can, uh, can appoint a tribunal to remove the president from office. What a huge responsibility. What huge authority. But wait a minute. The Deputy Chief Justice cannot assign duties to judges. Pray, my lords. What then does the Deputy Chief Justice deputize? What does she deputize? Jurisdictions like those referred to by the distinguished counsel on the other side. In many jurisdictions, including the United States, there is no office of deputy chief justice. In the Supreme Court of the United States, there is the chief justice and associate justices. In Kenya, the drafters of our constitution, and if I may say so myself with a bit of humility, I was one of the drafts. Knowing that in other countries there was no office of deputy chief justice, decided in Kenya there shall be an office of chief justice to deputize the chief justice. In doing what? I'll be very brief. That is to be found in the constitution itself and in the, in the statute. And uh, uh, I think uh, I will read my, I will read my learned friends, Mr. Gobo, Gobo, to deal with that. But let me, in the two minutes I've been granted by this gracious lady, make one point, two points. <laughs> Beneficiaries of expert orders stand before this court and say, only they are entitled to expert orders. They are here to, to complain that they went before Judge Gomba, they went before Judge Mwita, they got ex parte orders with finality, and that was okay. But when the Attorney General went ex parte, and all her prayers were refused, except the prayer to send the matter to the Chief Justice, she was wrong. How is that possible? My Lord, I want you to remember, because it is in your file, the transmission from Kiribati is in the portal. Unless my learned friends are saying they have never seen the portal itself. Yeah? The registrar in Kirinyaga, Honorable Wanyama, writes a letter, yes, saying, good evening, kindly find and attach the document for your attention. It has a title to the Chief Justice. It is on the 18th, uh, and it is, four, it is 15.45. It is 3.45 in the afternoon. So when counsel repeats again and again 
things were done at night. Well, a lie, a lie can can go halfway around the world before truth wears its pants. It is not true. It is not true. The registrar sends the order at 3.45 in the afternoon. I stop there so that my learning friend will continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, my notes, I will check it out from there. And I will dive right into the constitutional questions. The application before you for challenging the impanelment of this bench addresses itself a lot to the powers of the Chief Justice under Article 161 161.2a and b that establishes the office of the Chief Justice as head of the judiciary and of the deputy Chief Justice as the deputy head of the judiciary and conversely to Articles 163, 1b that again provides that the deputy Chief Justice shall deputize the Chief Justice and be the Vice President of the Supreme Court. My Lord and your Ladyship, it is now beyond my adventure, and again quoting from the CTF, that while counsel submitted that there may be instances of delegation, they ignored, my Lord and your Ladyship, that the law expressly provides instances or gives direction as to when the deputy, deputy chief justice shall exercise the powers of the chief justice. And my Lord, this is expressly set out at section 5, subsection 2A of the Judicial Service Act, sub 185B of the Law of Tenure. The Judicial Service Act expressly provides a law that the Chief Justice can deputize, or the Chief Deputy Chief Justice will exercise the powers of the Chief Justice in the absence of the Chief Justice. And Lord, the CTS and Banana Friend Professor didn't regard the part to this. There are only two professors senior counsel here, so it must be correct. My Lord, in the CTS, <laughs> it is clear that the Chief Justice communicated to the Deputy Chief Justice that should be a way to Geneva, Switzerland, and Milan, Italy, between the 12th of October 2024 and 24th of October 2024. That is my It's in the banner. It's on record. It's on record. In your answer, my pupil master called me to keep your voice in the banner. Keep your voice calm. There's no need to shout. I was asking the court whether this material is part of the court. It is. Or whether it is. Okay. 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 Through which these materials would then be introduced before you. My Lord, it is part of the record. The record. The, the, the material which is in the court portal is part of the court record. Yes. Okay. You're not cheap. If it is not on the portal, it's okay. If the material is in the court portal, it's part of the court record. Yes. You're not cheap. Yes. Mr. Sorry. 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 Yes. Just for good argument, I'll start with progress. And we know, in, because we access the portal through particular case numbers, in which case file is this material available right? that I just plug in and get to see. And my Lord, if you go to my place, you start educating to demonstrate to my other friends what file to do. Because this is important. I would have had no other way of accessing. Professor, can you just give us a reference? Yes, I yeah, For purposes of clarity. 
Yes, the Lord, zero crimes. We have three cases that are consolidated. We have accessed the portal in E, day of 15 of 2024. A transmission from Kaya Wanyama and E0 14 is consolidated. We have this material, we are aware of it. We have yeah. even gone further, my Lord, and served. And served or passed on the communication to my land, which is the public domain, my Lord. We could not have secured this communication anywhere else. Do you mean to say that what you're voting is on filed on CTS? It is, it is, it is, does it, have it is, yes. time? it is, the, what I have here is a copy of the CTS, the reference of the CTS office. We accessed, we only accessed it from the portal. We are accessing this. And this, I have first asked you for it. If an internal memo has just been given here, my colleagues are saying it's on the portal. If we knew the case number in which it was, we would have verified it. The other option would have been for my colleagues who are working a particular application this afternoon, have they had an affidavit value with documents? So the matter is that documents in the CTS have a timestamp, as my lady points out. The document we are having here does not have a similar timestamp. We are even we're just saying show us where it is so that we authenticate, then we make progress. It doesn't make sense to demean the rest of us huh? when you are asked to authenticate. You do precisely that, you authenticate. But also, I can confirm that it is even the physical file. The physical file. So that my land and friends do not have it, or that they are sure that it is not in the country, should be a point for response. They can respond and say, we saw the chief justice around. Although, <laughs> <laughs> if I may raise it to my time, they will have time to respond. Yes, the judicial report was. I, I, I can proceed. My, my, my lady, yeah, I have such a big question. We want to know in which case file in the portal, because that's the submission my colleague has made, there's this internal memo. First, I want to know the internal memos are normally in the portal. I'll, I'll be glad to learn. But more importantly, in which case file is this internal memo so that we can authenticate? That's simple. My colleague Dan will say it is in the portal. He has a duty to furnish us with the particulars. Uh, we have indicated, my lord, that it is in the physical file. My life frame is in the module specifically. At least in the so that I can proceed. Please, uh, uh, the, the applicants, when they are submitting, the respondents gave you time. Please just give them time to make their submissions. You are going to respond. There will be time for you to make a recommendation. Uh, well, the proceedings before you are in the public interest. They are in the public interest and therefore the question of time management and the need for expeditious disposal of the application before you cannot be overstated. But not the relationships. Time and again, when I first have submitted that whereas this court can sit at odd hours where it receives an application, that in matters as mundane as the current matter before you, that this court should have had this matter in the course of the day. Of course, no doubt, my lord, this court has moved to the electronic uh, age where matters are transmitted through, uh, through mail and through other forms. But, not, but most fundamentally, we are here to challenge ex parte orders, not inter parte orders, not orders given inter parties. And my line friends, therefore, cannot speak from both sides of the mouth that where you are dealing with matters of the impeachment of the deputy president, such as this, that expert orders cannot be issued, yet they obtained expert orders that necessitated the filing of the application before you. My Lord, what we're dealing with here is a removal under Article 145, and which the law defines as final under Article 145.7 of the Constitution. When therefore Melania friends submit about the office of the deputy president, they seem to forget that Article 145.7 refers to the finality of the act of Senate. 
And therefore, all the orders obtained under the subject, all the orders obtained under the subject of this procedure were obtained after the impeachment procedure, after the act of impeachment. And it is therefore important, my Lord, in the interest of all of us, that these matters are resolved expeditiously and timelessly, so that this court can move the next phase. And the next phase, my Lord, would be dealing with the question of the next step. My Lords and Relatives, it is clear that my life friends do not want to proceed in that, that phase. And that is, we have all this multiple for application <coughs> and the inability of the applicant to want to be confined to the question of time. They want to speak throughout the night. <coughs> On our part, we want to sanitize this proceeding Lord, and stick to the point that the application does not meet the threshold set out for recusal. Because the recusal is also a prayer. They have advanced no reason at all to want this court to recuse itself or to find that it was not empaneled in line with Article 161, 163, 52A of the Judicial <coughs> You will find, my lords, that this bench was properly constituted by the Deputy Chief Justice exercising powers donated to her by the Chief Justice. Unless they are saying that there is another Chief Justice. Thank you. My Lord, my ladies, as a follow-on to the submission by my two learned senior colleagues, uh, I wish to respond further to the application uh, as follows. There has been uh, a lot of water under the bridge since we convened, or since this court convened at about 11.15 or 11.30 this morning. Uh, but as I am no doubt members of the court will uh, be able to quickly figure out uh, the single issue that is before you is a challenge as to the regularity of this of, of, of the referral of the three or four matters to this bench by the Honorable the Deputy Chief Justice, uh, the Honorable the Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. And I wish to comment. I wish to commence my response to that objection by saying as follows: the Chief Justice occupies three distinct constitutional offices. Three separate and distinct constitutional offices. First, the Chief Justice, by dint of Article 161, sub Article 2A of the Constitution of this Republic, is the head of the judiciary. By dint of Article 163.1, the Chief Justice is the President of the Supreme Court. And by date of Article 248, sub Article 2E, the Chief Justice is a, the chairperson of a constitutional commission established under Chapter 15 called the Judicial Service Commission. Members of the court, I wish to take just a moment to demonstrate how the Chief Justice is deputized in these three distinct constitutional laws. In respect of her capacity as the President of the Supreme Court, Article 163, sub Article 1B is clear that the Chief, B, uh, the Chief Justice shall be the President of the Supreme Court, A, and that B, the Deputy Chief Justice shall deputize for the Chief Justice and shall be the Vice President of the Court. That is the first constitutional office. The second constitutional office is the head of the judiciary. And I will come back to Article 161 in a moment. Suffice it to say that it is in Article 161, sub Article 2, that the office of the Chief Justice is established. And Article 161, sub Article 2 states as follows There is established the office of the Chief Justice, who shall be the head of the judiciary. I will come back substantively to 2B in a moment. But it is important 
that for the purposes of the uh, uh, commission established under Article 248, sub Article 2E, the Deputy Chief Justice is then not the vice chairperson of that commission. In the Judicial Service Commission, the DCJ does not deputize the Chief Justice. Now, it is our it is our position for the respondents that 61 sub article 2A. That is not the president of the Supreme Court, that is not the chairperson of the Judicial Service Commission, but that function is exercised by the Chief Justice in her capacity as the head of the judiciary. It is our submission that, therefore, the Deputy Chief Justice, who is the Deputy Head of the Judiciary, by dint of Article 161, sub Article 2B, can exercise the function of the Chief Justice. Article 161, sub Article 2, creates three positions. The Chief Justice, the Deputy Chief Justice, and at sub Article C, it creates the office of the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary. Now, the Chief Registrar of the Judiciary doesn't deputize the Deputy Chief Justice. But the Deputy Chief Justice deputizes the Chief Justice. That does not require any interpretation. That is really comprehension as a matter of English. It is then for the Deputy Chief Justice, in instances where the Chief Justice is unable to act as the head of the judiciary, the Deputy Chief Justice can then perform that function. Members of the court, I submit that the decision in Lina Conchella is good law. And the facts in Lina Conchella are important. When you retire to consider your decision in this matter, you will note that the only respondent in Lina Conchella was the Chief Justice. The only respondent in Lina Conchella was the Chief Justice. If for the sake of argument, we go along with the submissions made by our learned colleagues for the applicants this evening, that the Deputy Chief Justice then cannot deputize for the Chief Justice. Then in Lina Conchella, when a judge of the High Court certified that the issue in that matter was one fit and proper for an expanded bench under, under Article 160, 163.4, 165.4, then going by the argument, then there would be nobody to impanel the bench because the Chief Justice was a party. How can he or she impanel a bench in a party where they are responding? That is the absurdity in the argument by the other side. And my Lord, it is our submission or it is our position that the constitution of this republic must remain elegant and it must remain functional. Interpretations such as the one are urged by the learned, my learned colleagues for the applicants that would lead to that sort of an absurdity should be rejected by the court. It is my position, as I am on my feet this evening, as I have been consistent, that the Constitution says what it says. But the Constitution only means what the courts of law in the Republic of Kenya interpret it to mean. And it is the interpretation of the Constitution that gives it life, that gives it meaning. And, my Lord, my Lady, it is therefore of my submission that it is a proper interpretation of the Constitution, flowing from the express provisions of Article 161, sub Article 2 down, that as you sit, as the three judges presiding over this matter this evening, you have no doubt as to the regularity of your environment. Because if you did, 
and flowing from the accolades that have been heaped upon you by Learned Council for the Africans, then you would not touch this file. There are other files that are equally added that deal with the same issue that have been brought to your attention this morning, this afternoon, and maybe again this evening, where you have said, in the absence of that direction, under Article 165, sub Article 4, you are unable to deal with those matters. So, my Lord, my ladies, being satisfied or you being satisfied with the regularity of your empanelment, this application is for dismissal. And I must add, with cost. <laughs> so that the important substance in this matter can be determined by the court. I'm most of them. Uh, my lords, uh, my ladies, permit me to just conclude with giving a bit of a context in the Conchella matter. I'll not go into explaining anything because, my lords and my ladies, the decision speaks for itself. The decision is a decision of five judges of the High Court. In particular, my lords and my ladies, paragraph 97 is instructive. 97B in particular, if I may, reads that the exercise of powers under Article 165.4 of the Constitution, though constitutionally underpinned, is administrative in nature. They go on to add that being administrative in nature, the said mandate can be exercised by the Deputy Chief Justice when the Chief Justice is absent when necessary, or if for good reason, the Chief Justice is unable to exercise the mandate. At D, they conclude that in the present circumstances, the rule against bias and the rule that no person shall be a judge in their own cause dictates that the Chief Justice, being the main respondent in the instance petition, could not sign, could not assign judges to hear the petition. My lords and my lady, that is the absurdity that learned senior counsel, Professor Gidu Gigai, was talking about. Take it a step further. Is it there for their case that if, as contemplated by your Lord, uh, the, their lordships in that matter, if for one reason or the other, the Honorable Chief Justice is unable to perform the functions of that office, is it there for their case that no matter that requires constitution of a bench will be heard or determined, that certainly would be an absurdity that the law would not have contemplated. That said, my lords and my lady, one of the things that will play out by close of business these submissions is that our learned friends from the other side have very deliberately taken to concealing what would otherwise be material information before this court. I say that for two primary reasons. I want my lords and my lady to make reference to their own application, to the grounds supporting the application. They start, the application is based on the affidavit of Honorable David Munya Matenge and other grounds. The other grounds include A, that on the 18th of October 2024, the petitioners herein filed the instant petition together with an application under certificate of agency seeking conservatory orders restraining the assumption of office by the second interested party pending the hearing and determination of the application and petition. They go on to say that on the same day, the matter was placed before the Honorable Justice Mongo, who considered the matter, and in light of the urgency of the matter and the weighty constitutional issues raised, the Honorable Judge issued the conservatory orders sought in the first instance and certified the matter as raising weighty constitutional issues and referred the matter to the Honorable Chief Justice to constitute a bench to hear and determine the petition. This is where now the story starts. That on the next day, being Saturday 19th, October 2024, the petitioners were surprised by the turn of events wherein they were served with the order of this Honorable Bench 
stating that the first and second respondents applications dated the 18th October 2024, in bracket the applications for uh, were to be had for their interparties hearing on the 22nd of 2024. Why do I say there is deliberate concealment of material facts? It is because, my lord, looking at the files that are coming up before this court today, that is E565 of 2024, before uh, the, 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 the court in Nairobi, and E015 of 2024 in Perugoya. We immediately, upon learning of the orders that have been issued and which have been adverted to here, file an application it is on record that application my lords and my lady sought several prayers one was that we wanted to have that application certified agent like in their case our application was certified agent again we asked that the court considers hearing the application outside the normal court hours including a possibility of being heard on a Saturday. My lords and my lady, that prayer was not granted. We also, as a third limb of our application, ask that the court considers granting an ex parte order staying the decision of uh, the Honorable Justice uh, Mongo and the Honorable Justice uh, uh, Waiter in the Nairobi matter. Again, my lords and my lady, that prayer was not granted. What followed was then the court, as would be the normal practice of that court, gave directions on how this application was to be dealt with. That is how we ended with the date of 2022. I mean, the uh, 22nd of uh, uh, October 2024. And why this is important, my lords and my lady, why is it their case? that when they file an application and get orders, it is convenient, it is okay, there is justice. When they get another order in Nairobi, it is okay, there is justice. When we get an order merely certifying our mother as being urgent, then there is, I mean, all, all hell breaks loose. And we're saying, if only our colleagues had sought to present this material before this court, we would not be talking about what, what we're talking about now. It would have been manifestly clear that we were here on account of an application. My lords and my lady, I have I've had very strange submissions coming up this afternoon. Submissions including that at the expert stage where the court is supposed to be giving directions, the parties expected that the court to have been given notice. Since when, my lords, do the courts in this division, and in this any other division, attend to matters under certificate? And at the expert consideration of those orders, invite parties for hearing of those orders. Why then do we call them expert? That submission, my lords and my lady, I repeat, is not for the consumption of this court. That, that submission can only go to serve an audience that is outside this court. Because the people in this court are fully aware of the rules governing the conduct of matters in this court. My lords, allow me a few more minutes just to point out a few other areas which then could speak to the reality of why then uh, uh, the omission of this material fact is then now being used to place this insinuation that the court either did something that was untoward or the, uh, 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 the Honorable, the Deputy the Chief Justice did something that is untoward. My Lord, my lady, at paragraph D, The, uh, the respondents in the application say, subsequent to the reference of the matter uh, to the Chief Justice on the 18th, the petitioners reasonably expected that once the Chief Justice issued directions on the file regarding empanelment, the petitioners would also be invited for mention before uh, the bench for directions as was directed by the Honorable Judge. If they didn't have an application, on what basis, therefore, was an order going to be issued to them? One would have expected that that would be something that would come from a party not represented. But a party represented would certainly be talking to an audience other than this audience. At paragraph G, my lord and the lady, they say they now have a direct accusation on her uh, relationship to the lady, uh, the honorable the, uh, deputy chief justice. Say that the deputy chief justice violated as called 1, 10, 27, and 50 of the constitution in ordering this bench to hear and determine three matters 
in which conservatory orders have been issued against the government of Kenya and its organs, namely, then they, there is no such order that came from and a perusal of the file could speak for itself. All that the, uh, uh, the, the Honorable the, the Deputy Chief Justice did was to constitute the bench. And in any case, this same bench is a bench that has been constituted by the Chief Justice herself. Questions that we ask ourselves. Why is it that when we appeared before this very bench last week on Tuesday, on the hearing of, on the hearing of their own application, we sat up to midnight? Today, because it is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the issue is on the other side, it becomes irregular. That cannot possibly be a parity of arms when you're dealing with the question of justice. Why is it that when they went all over asking for orders, and this speaks to why there are only two matters that came before this court, they tried a number of cases. In those other cases, there were no orders. What business did we have filing applications in those matters? We only felt that we were aggrieved with these orders, specifically because the effect of those orders was to suspend a provision of the Constitution. And that's why it's important for us that we deal with them. As we seek to deal with them, the only way that the rules of this court establish is that we make an application. And also, my lady, I look at, uh, finally, I think, uh, uh, their ground number L that they also sought to know the circumstances that led the, just, the Chief Justice to delegate uh, to the Chief, uh, to the Deputy Chief Justice. Then that I think has been spoken to. My lord, my lady, what then comes out is that if our counterparts had been candid with the facts in the file as they speak, we would not be wasting time as we are right now we would have had an opportunity to speak to the matters on the basis of the accuracy of the files. We would not be casting aspersions on the court as we have seen. We would not be casting aspersions on her, uh, on her leadership, the Deputy Chief Justice, as we have seen. We will not be casting aspersions on the Chief Justice as we have seen. My Lord and my lady, I repeat that that submission is meant to achieve two reasons, and two reasons only. One, to delay the proceedings that are before you today, we have an application and at the right time we'll be seeking an existing public card. And number two, to then create this negative impression, which I suppose, which I suppose is meant to be used at a later stage. I rest my case. <clears throat> Thank you, my, <clears throat> my lords and uh, my lady. My name is Kongara. I wish to submit only on two points of law which were actually articulated in support of the application. And these were that the proceedings before this court touch on the Bill of Rights, and they are vitally important that we should actually not be seen to flout the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is chapter four of our constitution runs all the way from Article 19 to 15. But I wish to remind the court that the Bill of Rights applies to every party that comes before the court, and it's not just one party. The proceedings we have before the court are very important to the petitioner. They are equally important to the respondents. And it goes without again saying that over 50 million Kenyans actually have an interest in these proceedings, and this is the reason why the agency has been certified both ways. My judges, as questions have been cast on the bench, so as to call for this recusal and application of Article 165.4, that you're being drawn into a conspiracy to commit injustice, because there is no emergency that requires you to hear this matter as a matter of emergency. Far from the truth, the two applications that are before you to set aside the conservatory order are as important as the applications that led to the granting of those orders. Therefore, the hearing of those applications must be speeded up and we are able to move with the matter ahead. You've also been accused of being enlisted in the service of the violation of the Constitution. Again, far from the truth. Because this is an allegation being made against you, while the position of the respondents is that justice must be served, 
expeditiously and as required by our constitution. Finally, Article 165.4, which uses the word aside and not appoint, in as much as this is a constitutional responsibility for the Chief Justice to assign, it is purely administrative. The word used is not appoint. We are using other words like empaneling and what have you. But, sorry, the word used is assign. And therefore, if the Chief Justice is not able to assign, nothing stops the, Chief the Deputy Chief Justice from making the assignment. That is number one. Number two, where it is expressly provided in this constitution that in the absence of the chief justice, the deputy chief justice will act relates to chapter nine, when the chief justice is dealing with the executive. In this particular instance, we are dealing with a judiciary where the head of the judiciary is the chief justice deputized by the deputy chief justice. So I also urge you to find but in fact, there was nothing wrong with the Deputy Chief Justice in the absence of the Chief Justice assigning the judges who were to deal with these two applications that were before them that particular day and the next applications which had been filed previously. Thank you. My Lord, in two minutes, my Lord, as you retire to consider the application, the name is my name, I would invite you to consider Article 259, my Lord, Sabbatical 3, and particularly, my Lord, B and C thereof. And if you allow me, my Lord, I will read it out. And it says, that every provision of this constitution shall be construed according to the doctrine of interpretation, that the law is always speaking, and therefore, among other things, be any reference to, in this constitution to a state or other public office or officer, or a person holding such an office, includes a reference to the person acting in or otherwise performing, my Lord, underline, otherwise performing the functions of the office at any particular time. My Lord, it's not disputed that the CTA was out of the country, <laughs> and that, my Lord, the DCJ was performing the functions, my Lord, of the CJ at that particular point in time. And my Lord, our attention has been drawn to the communication from the CJ that had particularly asked the DCJ to take charge. My Lord, therefore, Article 259.3b <coughs> provides an answer to the question that is before you. And my Lord, lastly, I'll read Article 259.3c, which reads, my Lord, and it says, a reference in this constitution to an office, state organ, or locality named in this constitution shall be read with any formal alteration necessary to make it applicable in the circumstances. My Lord, the circumstances before you were that the CJ was not available to give the directions or assign the bench. What the DCJ did, my Lord, was applicable in the circumstances. I invite you, my Lord, to refer to that provision when you be making your ruling. I thank you. Uh, I send the speaker of the Senate. The Lord allow me to make a very brief submissions without repeating what my colleagues have said. The Lord uh, allow me to start by quoting Article 145, Paragraph 7 of the Constitution, to just contextualize the reasons for our application uh, on uh, Friday last week. So Lord, if you look at the provisions of Article 145, Paragraph 7, Lord, the impeachment of a deputy president is a serious 
national stability matter? Well, because after votes by the Senate, in accordance with Article 145 7, the Deputy President, well, it, it says at least two thirds of all members of the Senate, when they vote to uphold any of the impeachment charges, the President shall seize the board office. In this case, as contextualized, the Deputy President, the former Deputy President, in this case, Mr. Gadi Kashagwa, seized the board office. My Lord, look at it also in the context of Article 22. My Lord, this former Deputy President, in exercise of his right uh, in the Bill of Rights, my Lord, moved the courts by way of a petition. My Lord, on Friday, that 18th of October, 2024, my Lord, conservatory orders were issued, which, in accordance with the petition, with the, with the, with the respondent's perspective, appear completely problematic. And my Lord, they required immediate intervention in terms of the respondents, my lord, moving the court. Because, my lord, the flip side, my lord, the flip side of Article 22 is that whereas you have a right to file a case in court and seek conservatory orders in accordance with Article 23, uh, paragraph 3a, a conservatory order which is discretionary, it means you are suing a respondent. Well, that respondent equally has a concomitant right to move to court, to, 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 to interfere, to set aside, to ask the court to vary that conservatory order. My Lord, the grant of that conservatory order is discretionary. So my Lord, there is nothing cast in, tone, in, in, in stone in terms of the, of the respondent, my Lord, coming to court to make an urgent application for the setting aside of that conservatory order. My Lord, there is also nothing strange for the court in public interest. My Lord, for the court in public interest, having looked at the grounds of this application to, just, to set aside these conservatory orders. My Lord, for the court to apply Rule 3 of the Mutunga Rules, my Lord, to make a just, expedient, and my Lord, proportionate decision in terms of directions on how to dispose of this matter. My Lord, again, under Section 60 of the Evidence Act, we all need to take judicial notice of the fact that, that my Lord, now we have the e-filing system. My Lord, when such extraordinary matters come to court, my Lord, the court is empowered. My Lord, at any time, my Lord, at any time of the day, my Lord, at any time to access the system, and my Lord, to give appropriate directions for the expeditious resolution of this dispute. My Lord, they benefited from these orders on Friday. My Lord, unlike, my Lord, unlike them, my Lord, we had the courtesy, because my Lord, we saw the court orders in the social media, and we responded accordingly. But my Lord, unlike them, we were, we were courteous enough to serve the orders which were issued by this court to the respondents. So it cannot lie in the respondent's mouth to say that they have been ambushed to come to court to the extent that they come to court and say that we are acting under protest. We did serve them with these court orders. And my Lord, on the last, uh, last aspect of that point, is that my Lord, then this petition, who has come to court under certificate of urgency, my Lord, my Lord, having absented himself on, uh, at, uh, at the Senate on Thursday for health reasons. May I please? Uh, that, uh, that is okay. That is good. So, my Lord, I'm just winding up. Lord, to, yeah, to, to emphasize the contradiction. He did not absent himself. Sickness is not absent himself. <laughs> <laughs> my Lord, I can refresh. My Lord, I can refresh. My Lord, but, this but petition. As well, avoid it. Yes, my Lord. This petition. Huh? 
<laughs> let him avoid it. Yes, yes. Let him yeah, avoid it. Yeah, he has avoided it. Just as a minister without mercy and wisdom is not justice. <laughs> Here you are, you have someone who is in the 60s, he is saying he is sick, he has cardiological problems, and he will come and play it down. These are principal advice of the government. The yeah, <laughs> <laughs> can I now conclude? Have you withdrawn that? Yes, my lord, I'm, I'm just I was making a contradiction by saying that the petitioner uh, was able to access the court expeditiously and that the court was able to, uh, to, to grant him conservative orders on Friday. Uh, my lord, the same petitioner cannot then uh, come to court and complain. My lord, complain when. Uh, my lord, the, 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 the chief justice, uh, my lord, the deputy chief justice, my lord, in public interest, and given the extraordinary nature of this matter, my lord gives directions that this bench be constituted for purpose of, determ of determining the underlying question. My lord, the petitioner cannot approbate and reprobate, can't speak on both sides of the mouth. So, my lord, uh, the other extraordinary uh, nature of this matter, my lord, is that the, pe the petitioners, I filed a multiplicity of suits. But not, you, you have heard that there were, there, 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 there were three cases in Ikerugoya alone. But not, other cases were filed in Nairobi. My Lord, Kenyans, my Lord, this is the consumption of justice. My Lord, just a few days ago, uh, uh, the Chief Justice had appointed this bench to determine these matters for the satisfaction of Kenyans. My Lord, in the public domain, Kenyans are aware that this bench has been appointed. So, my Lord, what is wrong? What is so different? What is so strange for the Deputy Chief Justice when the Chief Justice is away? Again, for the same, same reason. For purpose of expediency and, and my Lord, for purposes of uh, laying a multiple basis for consistency in judicial decision making, for these matters to be brought before this bench by way of a direction uh, in terms of uh, uses uh, being used of this matter. So, my Lord, I don't see anything extraordinary. My Lord, as I wind up, the petitioners have just simply cast aspersions to the process of appointment. There's nothing cogent. Lord, I don't see any integrity issues uh, with respect to the handling of this matter by the Chief Justice. I don't see any integrity issues with respect to the handling of this matter by the bench. So, my Lord, our plea, my Lord, our sincere plea is that the underlying dispute with respect to the setting aside of the conservatory orders, my Lord, in accordance with the, with the directions which were issued, should be urgently determined, my Lord. My Lord, in public interest. Thank you. Uh, my Lord, uh, for the big respondent, I'll be very brief. I just wish to remind us on the for the for the six respondent now in the new order. First, I wish to set the record straight in terms of the some misrepresentation that has been made with regard to the decision cited, the Lena Conchera decision. When the, uh, uh, the petitioners were submitting, they were not aware that I am one of the petitioners in this matter and that I am fully versed with the entire set of facts. So they misrepresented that the matter is not active. Nothing can be further from the truth. This matter is active. It was mentioned on the record of September 2024 before a new bench that was constituted following the accession of the honorable judges who were previously dealing with it. And it is due for further mention on that year of October 2024. 
So the decision remains solid in terms of it is its capacity to persuade you not to depart from it because no reason has been, uh, has been supplied save for the misrepresentation that it should not be utilized. Now, allow me, my lord, to make reference to the High Court Organization Administration Act in light of the issue that has been raised on the sittings of the court, I will briefly cite verbatim section 10 on the sittings and recess sessions of the court, where it is put as follows, that the court shall subject to subsection 2, 3, and nine, sit continuously for the trial of criminal cases and disposal of civil and other legal business of the court. There is no disclaimer whatsoever with regard to the time that the court should sit. So the court can sit at any point in time, day or night. Indeed today, when dusk came, I was apprehensive that counsel for the petitioners might leave since the court is, is, is sitting past 18 hours, presumably. <laughs> so the point that must uh, lag home is that nothing prevents this honorable court from sitting at any time, such that then the issue of when the courts are, when the files were transmitted, when the orders were released, whether on Saturday, whether on Sunday, though it has not been shown that is what transpired, the court has liberty to sit on such occasions if need be. With regard to the issue of the empanelment by the Deputy Chief Justice, again on this account, the petitioners have misapprehended the import of Article 165 court. Because what is fundamental is that there be a substantial question of law. And that question of law is, satis is satisfied on the discretion of a high court judge. What that means is that the same issues that are being heard here today could have been heard by even a single judge, if at the discretion of the judge who had the matter, reasoned that there was no substantial question of law. So what the Honorable Chief Justice or anybody else capable of exercising the powers within the office of the Chief Justice does is administrative. All the high court judges are qualified to deal with matters of such nature. All of them. So assigning one or the other is routine. It is pure administrative. There is nothing that is exceptional intellectually in terms of requiring a special exercise of powers when it comes to dealing with that aspect. So in a nutshell, I would wish that, uh, to point out that in a hurry to come to court, the, petin the petition has even wrongly enjoined the six respondent, is excellency the president, when Article 143 is clear that no civil proceedings can be instituted against the president. A decision that has been affirmed by the Supreme Court in the decision of Attorney General and two others versus D and 79 others. So the Supreme Court made an express order that the president cannot be sued. It's an order. So the proceedings, the pleadings that have been uh, lodged before this court have been filed in contempt of the Supreme Court decision and they should amount to nothing 
in the full and uh, final set of uh, facts. So I'll be seeking that the bench continues to stay put so that uh, as early as possible, I can seek to have the six respondents discharged from the illegal, uh, the irregular proceedings uh, initiated by the by the, by the petitioners and which they don't want concluded. They want to thrust this country into a crisis. Under Article 146, there is possibility of the office of the president becoming vacant on account of various issues. Either through death, which is uncertain, through resignation, because he can say that resignation and decide that I think I've had it too much, he can say that resignation, or any other reason that may arise. So at the moment, Upon the Senate voting on the first ground of impeachment, we stood without a deputy president. So what would happen in the event we have a vacancy in the office of the president? We are staring at a crisis. We don't have a deputy president. The honorable speaker of the assembly can raise up for 60 days. We don't have an IBC. So what the petitioners are doing is commenting a crisis of monumental pro pro uh, proportions, which we will not be able to find about. So I humbly uh, uh, pray my Lord, my lady, that uh, you fight favor in the arguments of the respondents and dismiss the application by the petition. I was going to I receive the offer. Let's eat the offer. I'm not going to get very well. I think it's one thing that I will be referring to the judge of the right of Justice Murima. Justice Murima. <laughs> well, I grew up in a crew, I don't have the problem of a male and an hour. So I need to <laughs> Are you the only person submitting now on this? Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in my minutes, huh? the 20 minutes. What to do <laughs> There were 20 minutes, yes. And I said I'm doing 15. Mr. Ongoya will do five. That's what I'm saying. He asked for 20. I'll do 15. All right. And Kaminoa, because of seniority, is asking for five. No, I have to use 15. There were very many people who say those things. So I, 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 I need 15 and Mr. Ongoya, we need five. five. Manota, the, let, let, let me start at least for one point. My Lord, my learned colleague, Mr. Daigua, whom I respect a lot, is saying that uh, probably we start with the uh, two points raised by our learned colleague, Mr. Joseph Kamoto. My Lord, 